Good afternoon, this is your gentleman B970 and this afternoon we'll be doing the final part of Paying Respects to Lewis Johnson in the history and chronicles of playing the bass. Um, as we all know, Lewis Johnson was a teenage type guy that was very into Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles and in those days people used to play music in a very free, open way. And, you know, Lewis Johnson and the Brothers Johnson, they were really cool guys. You see the video where they're very foxy and smooth and cool and everything else in the soul scene and they released a record which was on 12 inch vinyl and if there's DJs out there that are not quite sure um, around about 1977-76 around about that time was when 12 inch records was first being made and Strawberry Letter 23 by the Brothers Johnson is in the very first batch of 12 inch records released around the world um, and some people know the rest of the tunes and they weren't all disco tunes there was a few rock tunes and a few pop tunes in there but predominantly um, 12 inch records was the fuel that launched disco so around about 1978 the whole world now was disco crazy and in Leicester Square in the Empire Ballroom, Leicester Square, they had the world's first ever disco dance championship and it was won by the guy from Japan. He beat the guy from New York. So, disco was all over the world and around about that time, Bootsy done a gig in London and as we've seen in the video, we remember Jimi Hendrix coming to London and in just one gig, Jimi Hendrix changed the way people played guitar all the way around the world. And so Bootsy was hyped up to the same feeling. He goes, once we've done this gig, people are going to play bass entirely different. But it didn't quite happen that way, the same way as it happened with Jimi Hendrix, but it did happen. So when Bootsy was doing the gig, there were fans in London and, and UK and they heard the tunes, they sort of like knew um, So they knew these tunes and in their bundle they would have had the Ohio Players, BT Express, the Fatback Band, Cameo, Isaac Hayes, the Hudson people, and so on. So the fans that went there, they had their sort of like soul bundle, but they'd never ever seen Bootsy play a gig, do a date. So when the fans saw the gig, they've all come out, oh my God, oh my God, what's wrong? Bootsy was slapping the bass. Oh my God, oh my God, what did you see? That new band, you know, those young guys, yeah? Uh, Brothers Johnson, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were slapping the bass too. That's right. Slapping the bass, baby. Hit me. Hit me with your rhythm stick. Hit me. Hit me. Hit me with your rhythm stick. Hit me. So now you can understand the sort of impact that Bootsy had. Where you had someone like Ian Jury now do a parody type of what Bootsy was doing. You know, and obviously Bootsy's bass is the rhythm stick. And people just couldn't believe what was coming out of Bootsy's bass. And it was the same with the Brothers Johnson. You know. <laughs> Musicians that went to the gig 
were mainly reggae guys in the aspects where you know their dad was a reggae musician you know and they give give them you know handed down instruments or their uncle was a drummer and you know, so he gets the nephew a guitar or a bass so most of those guys are into reggae that go and see the beat so the who see the gig most of those guys are into reggae <laughs> They knew about soul, but to them it was a bit of a novelty, you know, George McRae and stuff like that. That's the sort of level that the reggae guys saw soul. So now these guys are now running home to go and get their bases to try and do what Bootsy did. And that's how Brit Funk started. And Brit Funk is very much based on three note grooves. which was a dance if people don't know what the sudden freeze is it was a dance where you were dancing and he did stop so that was dubbed the sudden freeze this is a bit later on you know about a year or so later so most of the musicians now they're running home now to try and do what Bootsy's doing and I'm a disco dancer, I didn't go to the gig, you know, I wasn't really into going to gigs and stuff like that. You know, I wasn't into music, I was into dancing. That's how we used to see it, because up in those days, music was all to do about rock. And we weren't really into rock. So, being a disco dancer, I knew a few guys, and in the bass tag, you know, I used to play a bit of rhythm guitar. You know. <laughs> You know, um, obviously I didn't play rhythm guitar like that, but, you know, I knew how to play a major chord and a minor chord and stuff like that. So I went round the guy's house and, you know, he's playing bass like this. <laughs> And I'm like that, oh my god, that's crazy, how can he do that? And then he played another bass line. And that was it, I had to go and get a bass. Being a disco dancer, it was the very, very first time that I heard anyone play disco on an instrument, and not only that, they were playing it in the latest way of playing a bass available. And so that was it, I dropped everything and I wanted to be a bass player. So the, the first round of musicians that went to the Bootsy gig, they're the ones that started Brit Funk and they got signed up and became really big musicians. And then you had another round of bass players and they're the teenager, younger guys. And we used to go around the guy's house and he'd be playing bass. Then they'd let us have a go and we'd be there trying to learn it. So obviously we didn't have instruments. So we used to go to the music shops to look for basses. So now you understand why it took so long to do the video. Because when we think in terms of Mark King, uh, Mark King uh, went to the London Bass Show in 2011. And about a month later, Mark King came online. He says, well, you know, I'm from the Isle of Wight. And, uh, you know, I went to London one day and I got a job in a music shop and I started to see people slapping the bass. So now you understand why B970 took so long to do the video, because I was one of the bass players that Mark King saw go in the music shop because we were looking to buy basses. We already knew how to play because we were going around the guy's house and now we wanted to buy our own bass. So for Novak... Ramos, all the people in that are into level 42 in Holland, Bulgaria, and all those places where level 42 are almost like, like the Pope. So now you know, B970 was one of the bass players that Mark King saw that made him become a bass player. <laughs> 
times so now you get it and when I was at the London Bay show um, last year I met a few guys from YouTube and I said you can go all the way through this bass show and you won't find nobody playing bass before me funk bass before me and I said it this year and the guy you know was going didn't really understand it so now I've done a really long like video so you can deep six everything so it all makes sense and now you can understand where B970 fits into the history of music so when you've got a guy talking about Lewis Johnson because that's who we're paying tribute to and he picks up his bass and goes sunburst music man he's telling you the truth um, and when you've got all of the other guys that talk about Lewis Johnson on the internet and they say we all agree even me I agree that Larry Graham was the first person to slap bass but it was Lewis Johnson via Bootsy that showed the world how to slap bass and when you say slap bass that's where it came from it came from that gig they all came out oh my god what's he doing he's slapping the bass it's not a Dutch word it's not a Swedish word it's not a Danish word or a Norwegian word it's an English word it's not even an American word as we've explained when you've got people like the bass wizard and that they might watch the video and now they will understand uh, you know why Lewis Johnson is so important so for the level 42 fans out there what were the bass lines that I used to play in the music shop in those days now, I didn't do uh, Lewis Johnson because he was a bit too complicated in those days for us to play. We were just the beginner bass players that wanted to get a bass. So if I went into a music shop and found a bass that I liked, and you've got to realize that all of the basses in the music shops in those days were set up for rock. I mean, a lot of the basses still had flat wound strings and stuff, you know, on them. So we'd look and look and look and then find a bass to look like it was playable and I would play a bass line like this. don't know that bass line it's let's dance together and I think it's by Styx Hooper or Walton Felder uh, nevertheless it's by the Jazz Crusaders Joe Sample Walton Felder Styx Hooper and Robert Popswell who is the bass player for for the Crusaders so that's the bass line that we would play in the music shops but what I want to do to level 42 fans is put them into a scenario where you know all of a sudden I've gone right I found a base in Denmark Street that's what we call it and I want to buy it and so if I found a base that I really thought I was going to buy I would play this type of bass line <laughs> and some people will be saying you know that's Mr. Pink it's not Mr. Pink it's Cosmic Rain by the Crusaders and so you can imagine now Mark King downstairs sweeping out um, the basement and then hearing a noise and coming upstairs and seeing a guy playing that bass line and he said that's it I want to I want to now learn how to play bass so I'm not saying that's true I'm saying to the level 42 fans you put yourself into that scenario and that's how you begin to understand Mark King and obviously Mark King a few years later uses that bass line as Mr. Pink and obviously um, the guy that we know more which is Paul Tubbsy Williams who is the very first uh, street bass player in the United Kingdom who left the building in 2009 by the way um, you know he also uses that bass line on a, on a tune called Emergency so when we were going in the shop Paul Tubbsy Williams was still starting to record that tune that's why we knew the bass line because you know I don't go online and sort of like name drop and stuff like that but there were times very early on where Paul Tubbsy Williams would be in one room and you could see him playing the bass and I'd be in another room playing the bass and he'd be sweating and I'd be sweating 
and then they go back and do um, a proper recording and and you know with on Chris Hill's label because it was Chris Hill that had the record label. <coughs> so in those days, in 1978, 1979, if you could play a bass line like this, that's the same as Victor Woden now saying, doing a bass line like you can't play no groove. You know, it was really, really technical. And if you could play a bass line like that in those days, the chances are that you'd get a record deal on the spot literally on the spot if an A&R man walked into the music store and saw a bass player like that you know he'd whisper in their ear and say like do you want a record deal and some bass players took those record deals but they were for punk bands and new, new alternative bands or romantic bands and stuff and so when you look at a lot of the uh, early British uh, pop music you've always got the funky bass player in the background and stuff and even Spandau Ballet you know they started to hire funky bass players to help them do their tunes me myself I was driven all the way to Liverpool in those days because nobody in Liverpool had ever seen someone slapping the bass apart from on telly so I went down there you know and I had scores of musicians come up and said yeah you've got to go like this <laughs> How'd you do that? How'd you do that? You gotta practice and stuff like that. So that's what it was like. And you know, even me in our small bands, we were virtually signed up. But then when we found out what the guy was doing, you know, I was out the door. And I quit the music industry in 1982, 1983, and I sort of like made a promise that I don't want to join no bands. And the reason why is because if I joined a band, they go, yeah, you're really good. You know, we want you to sign for this band or we want you in a, in a record deal. So I didn't want to join no bands in the fear of getting signed up. Um, I didn't want to do no gigs, nothing. I turned my back on the music industry around about 1982. So that's why you don't see B970 necessarily in, in any bands you know, like the rest of the guys, all of the guys that I that I knew, the second wave of bass players, they've all had records and gigs and number one hits and stuff, but I pulled out very, very early on. And I always take the music industry with a pinch of salt. And I was on the internet a few years ago and I had an American band come over to me and say they wanted me to be their bass player. And, you know, I just didn't take it seriously. Thank God I didn't. Because if I took it seriously, you know, I would have been conned out of my life type of thing. We don't know what was going on. <coughs> so now you understand who B970 is in history. And so when you're thinking in terms of Marlo DK, and Marlo DK went like that, that's because he found out who B970 was. When you've got the other guys that were in there and saying, yeah, I know all about funk, don't tell me. And then they told him who B970 was they stopped doing videos and stuff like that it's not to say that I'm a really good bass player but what it is is the history of playing the bass there were literally a handful of bass players playing funk on the streets outside of America and B970 was one of those bass players and the reason why you don't see B970 on, on a on an Incognito album or a Galliano album or a Haircut 100 album is because he turned his back away from those people very, very early on. And what I say to people is I'm not prepared to die to become famous. And that's what basically was going on in those days. So now we understand in respects to Lewis Johnson and you get the guy and he lifts up the bass there's a video where he lifts up the bass and it's a music man bass you know and that's real uh, that Lewis Johnson was the guy along with Bootsy that showed the world how to slap the bass and I've been through all the history so you can see it uh, Lewis Johnson leaving the building is a milestone 
in the history of playing the bass. And as you can see, that if it wasn't for that gig that Bootsy did, you know, none of us would actually be playing the bass this way anyway. So thank you very much for watching um, the show. Instead of going on with Lewis Johnson, I'm just going to do a little bit on Bernard Edwards at the end so people can understand Bernard Edwards was um, the next James Jameson. Thank you.